Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the SCL cohort virtual site visit. We thank you for joining us today. And our first facilitator will be Mark, Mort Sherman. So you can take over, Mort. Thank you, Lois. And thank you for all the great work you do in setting up these visits and keeping all of us on schedule and moving mm -hmm. ahead. It is really great to see all of you, to hear all of you, to see your names. And um, on, the, on the, uh, the Zoom board there, I'm not sure exactly what the technical term is. We're trying to create um, a, an opportunity today for presentation and discussion and some interaction very different than from what a, a traditional webinar right, might be. For those of you who are part of our cohorts, you know, when we do site visits, we, we walk through classrooms, we um, have walk through charts, and we get to talk with each other and share ideas and learn from the host district. We're not able to replicate that experience exactly, but we want to get really close to it to starting today and over the next couple of weeks and talking directly to those who are uh, involved with SEL in, at Andover. Let us get started by setting the stage for, I think, the importance of today's conversation. Um, you know, Valerie and I and others who have the good fortune to talk probably just point to thousands of uh, districts and uh, to, to thousands of superintendents and district leaders across the country. One of the issues that comes up in every single group and every single conversation is SEL, whether it's mental health or trauma or related issues, but clearly the concern about how we support our children, whether they're preschool or graduating seniors, it is a universal concern. So we are creating this virtual site visit um, in a way to try to dig deeply at those issues of how you deal with the virtual world. How do you make the transitions back? And I don't think this conversation today at this point in our, in our lives could be uh, complete without at least starting and acknowledging the imperative of equity and justice and social justice and care for each and every child in America. So as we look at this work today, and as we look at uh, what's happening across America, um, I want you to know that ASA and Melissa Schlinger, who's joining us from Castle, I see her as one of the participants. We are deeply committed to addressing SEL issues, to supporting children, staff, uh, and the communities that we serve. And, and I don't know there's a handbook anywhere to be found on the shelf with all the answers. And so collectively, let's work on these issues. Let's try to come up with some answers and then serve the rest of America by finding out um, what, what are some of the best practices. So let us get right to the work um, and turn the microphone as, as it is over to my colleague, superintendent of schools in Stratford, Connecticut, one of our great leaders in the country in dealing with SEL, um, Janet Robinson. Take it away, Janet. Thanks, Mort, and welcome to everybody who's here today that gave up part of your day to, to join this discussion. I hope it's a worthwhile um, as discussion for everybody. and We do want to share some best practice. Uh, I know many of you know me that I was the former superintendent in Sandy Hook at the time of Sandy Hook. So I feel very strongly about the work we're doing here in SEL and all the benefits it has for our teachers and our students. We're so fortunate today to be on this visit to Ando, Andover, which we would have made um, except for the exceptional health problem that we have in this country. So we're doing it virtually. Uh, just as all of us as educators are so highly creative and can uh, be flexible too. So welcome to all of you. And I'd now like to introduce you to Dr. Shelley Berman, who is the superintendent in Andover, and ask Shelley if he'd like to introduce his panel. Great. Well, thanks, Janet, and thanks to everybody who's joined. Uh, this is exciting. I see that there are about 53 people on, which is very exciting to see all the all the people have joined us. Um, I, I will go through the introduction of the panel. Um, you're going to hear uh, from uh, some of the just wonderful district leaders that we have in, uh, in and policy leaders that we have in Andover. Um, I'm very excited to share some of the work that, that we've been doing. I want to preface it by saying uh, two things. One is we're a work in progress. This is all, all of us are a work in progress. And so uh, we don't, we haven't mastered it all. We're still on our way, um, but this is a way of sharing, you know, what we've been discovering, what we've been doing, what we find effective, as well as uh, you know, sharing with you where we're still working. And um, as you saw in the opening slide, there are four 
uh, sort of parts of this. The first part is leadership, and you're going to hear from leaders today. So let me begin by uh, introducing um, uh, the panel uh, that you'll be hearing from. Uh, first is uh, Sandy Trock, who's our Assistant Superintendent for Teaching and Learning. She's waving if you can see her. Hi, everyone. <laughs> uh, next is uh, Pam, Pamela Lathrop, who's a principal at High Plain Elementary School, and uh, she actually chairs our, uh, what we call our social emotional learning and uh, cultural responsive uh, practice sprint, and she'll say more about that. Um, on our, uh, we in Massachusetts call, call school board school committees, um, but uh, one of our members of our school committee now, but has been chair in the past is Susan McCready and she's waving right now. Uh, and then uh, focusing in on uh, mental and behavioral health, which is a, a really uh, an aspect of the work that I think we're all trying to do, is Sarah Stetson, who's our Assistant Superintendent for Student Services. And Good afternoon, well, everyone. And, and then wrapping it up, we, you'll hear a little bit about assessment, and we're very privileged to have Hannah Tola, who's our data and financial analyst, but she's just a, an extraordinary individual who has taken our data and helped us analyze it and take a look at it. So that's, uh, that's the panel. Um, I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction to share where we are and how, how we've begun. And so I was privileged to serve on uh, the as a uh, member of the Council of Distinguished Educators for the National Commission on Social Emotional Academic Development. And one of the things that really stood out uh, as a result of that work was a statement in their report saying, children learn best when we treat them as human beings with social emotional needs as well as academic needs. And uh, frankly, the, the core of that is that you can't divorce emotion and academics. Uh, and so the two are intimately tied together, and that's the way we have uh, worked. We've developed a set of strategic goals, and there are four strategic goals, but at the centerpiece of those strategic goals are the caring and responsive classrooms, uh, rigorous curriculum, inclusive instruction, and progress monitoring. And you'll hear a bit about all of that as you hear the presentations today. But the, one, of the folk, one of the emphases that we have is on caring and culturally responsive classrooms. There's a core principle behind this, and that is that we believe that the social curriculum is as important as the academic curriculum. It takes as much planning, as much time, as much thought, and we have to really carefully understand what we are sharing with our students because we are the models and we create an environment that is critical to them behaving in ways and learning in ways that uh, support the development of social skills. And our essential goals, as I see it, are first to help students develop the ability to take the perspective of another, to resolve conflicts positively, and to move from dialogue, from debate to dialogue and polarization to common ground. And in a sense, what we're really looking for is students to be active participants in our society, to have a sense of social responsibility and a sense that, that they can contribute. And to do that from a perspective of inclusivity so that they understand that all students are, need to be included. And one of the core elements of what we do is focus on a sense of community. Um, I've been defining sense of community as students' experience of being valued, influential contributors to a group that is dedicated to the learning and well-being of all its members. You know, oftentimes we think of ourselves as autonomous individuals functioning within the larger society, but we are members of a community, and when we come to understand that we're a member of a community, we understand that our actions have impact on others, and that that impact uh, has consequences for the entire community. And it's in that understanding that students begin to see their place and to begin to see how much of a difference they can make with others. Now there's some core practices, practice components, and there, there are four practices that we focus on um, in the district. First of all, it's direct social skill instruction. Um, so we're providing uh, students with the skills, uh, social emotional skills that they need uh, to function well. And you'll hear more about that in a moment. We're trying to integrate that into <laughs> academic instruction in a constructive way. We're also looking at classroom and school climate and culture so that it creates that sense of community. And finally, we're trying to give students the practical experience in community through 
you know, acts of service, service learning, buddy programs, whatever we can do to ensure that they see that their good work and their skills can be enacted in the larger community and respected in the larger community. So let me draw a picture for you about the sort of systemic approach. As I said at the beginning, um, that we are um, attempting to create a, a program that is systemic in nature, that flows um, from one of each of the, that has a focus on each one of these areas, but flows from area to area and builds. So for example, in social skill instruction, our teachers have been, some of our teachers have been using second step curriculum, some of them using open circle and open circle dates well past when I came here. Um, and we are transitioning in the way to second step. But we're also integrating uh, the uh, social emotional learning into our curriculum. Uh, obviously, we've moved to a more collaborative style of teaching and learning. Um, we are also working on integrating uh, literature into our curriculum. So for example, on our, we have elementary uh, classroom libraries that are representative of the diversity of our student body, that are representative of uh, cultures around the world, that have characters uh, that represent different races, different ethnicities. Uh, we've looked deeply at how we can represent that kind of inclusivity uh, within our, our regular curriculum. Uh, you will hear if you're part of the next presentations, uh, a curriculum called One Community, One Nation, which is our social studies curriculum that has a set of civic dispositions deeply embedded in, in that uh, curriculum that essentially looks at perspective taking, finding common ground, resolving conflicts. The things that are the, uh, what I would say is the civic embodiment of some of the social skills. But in addition to curricular integration, we step back and say, what's the community like? And we've been using a program called Responsive Classroom uh, to uh, facilitate community building. We have student councils at the middle school level. We use a program called Where Everybody Belongs. Uh, at the high school, we, use a, we have an advisory program, which we call an H block advisory. Uh, and, uh, and then across all the areas, K to 12, there are service projects that students are engaged in in a really comprehensive way. Uh, I forgot to say at the high school, we have had a program, particularly in, uh, and I think uh, Sandy Truck will talk about this, around hate facing history in ourselves, which not only is a very powerful curriculum, but it's an organization that is helping us work on culturally responsive practices. So we've tried to think systemically and that's the sort of broad perspective. And now we're sort of with each of the panelists, we're gonna go into some of the more specifics. So I'll turn this back to you, Janet. Okay, Shelly. Shelly, this is really very helpful. We see all the components you've worked so hard in and um, is very, very helpful. You know, with, in, when you're asked uh, by uh, community members or people that you meet, um, you know, really what, what, how do you synthesize and just give them a definition for social emotional learning and what what is also the, your operational de definition for that cultural responsiveness that you're talking about we define the social responsibility or social you know the social development in a broad sense and see it as the development of social skills and, and emotional skills that enable students to function well within uh, their classroom with it with others within their classroom and within the larger society and in terms of uh, culturally responsive practice we believe that uh, we have a, a primary focus on equity uh, we actually and uh, Susan may talk about this at some point but we actually are working on an equity policy right now for the district uh, that will uh, sort of uh, institutionalize our work in equity uh, but in terms of culturally responsive practice we want to be inclusive <laughs> create an inclusive environment that's responsive to all individuals. I think uh, I'm going to hold off on one thing that Pam is going to share because she has the clear target around uh, this work with our, our sprint work. And so I, I think it, I, I'll pass that to her to address the rest of that. Hi, everyone. Um, as Shelley said, as Mort said, I'm Pam Lathrop, I'm a principal of one of our elementary schools. And I really just want to say thank you to AASAA for having us here today. Um, we were really excited about bringing you to Andover and disappointed when we had to cancel. And so it was really, um, it was great that you thought outside the box and we were able to bring this virtually. 
Of course, I really wish that I was walking you through the halls of High Plain Elementary School right now because I think it comes to life a little bit better when we have an opportunity to be in our school. But I'll do the best that I can through this uh, virtual way. So um, as educational leaders in Andover, we develop Andover's theory of action. I think it's important to note that the theory of action is something that's agreed upon by all of our stakeholders. And when I talk about stakeholders, I mean our teachers, our support staff, our administrators, and our school committee. Our shared mission is to collaborate to create safe, caring, culturally responsive classrooms and schools and partners with our families and our community to support students' academic growth and their social and their physical and their emotional well-being. This mission evolved into what we're calling our SEL Sprint. It's the time that we get to dive deep into the work um, so that our students are able to demonstrate cultural awareness and an appreciation of self, of empathy towards others, sense of responsibility, and a commitment to civic engagement. I think it's really important to mention that our theory of action identified other areas. We're looking at rigorous curriculum, innovation, progress monitoring, all of which have their own sprints. But um, when we as leaders had an opportunity to, to weigh in on the things um, that we wanted to participate in in Andover, by and large, the SEL sprint was one where everybody stuck their hand in their air or they had listed as their first or second choice. I think it really speaks to the fact that SEL is very uh, important in our district um, that it shows the value of social emotional well-being and a commitment of our district leaders to do this really important work. So our social emotional sprint currently has eight members. I co-chair it with Dr. Linda Croto and she's an assistant principal at Woodhill Middle School. Um, and then our other members are uh, other administrators within our district. I wanna point out that this is an agile strategic plan and that the planning process is flowing and impactful. If you think of a more traditional model of planning, there are usually specific timelines, perhaps a very definite schedule, but the agile planning really allows us to have frequent informal meetings among our group and depending on what's happening, it gives us some opportunity to maybe pivot or adjust as we need. So when you think about social emotional learning, our world is ever evolving. And so because it's an, we have an agile plan, our committee is able to come together as leaders and address concerns as they happen. And I believe that because of this planning, we have been able to move some initiatives forward at a, at a rate that you know, I think is quicker than what would be in a traditional kind of uh, a planning approach. So the SEL Sprint came up with four major initiatives. So our first initiative really was to focus on professional development for our staff in order to advance the goal of caring and culturally responsive classrooms and schools. I know that um, Sandy Trock is gonna talk more about this when she has a chance to speak to you. But briefly, what we learned is that our staff members really wanted to provide high quality instruction in the area of SEL and culturally responsive practices. Um, through some of the work that we did in Andover, we met with all of our teachers and we asked them what was important to them and what did they need. And all of them said to us, yes, we, this is so important and we really want our kids to feel safe, to feel valued and to feel connected in our schools, but we need help. And I think it's really important as leaders to recognize that before you can push social emotional growth forward, you have to educate your leaders and your staff members and the people that are working with the kids. And, you know, even as we are grappling with what's the exact definition of social emotional learning, if, if we are the leaders and we're still struggling with that, imagine how sometimes classroom teachers feel. So I really want to emphasize the importance of providing professional development for, for, for people as they're embarking on this work. And I think what um, has really helped us is that it's been professional development that has been um, you know, hand in hand or shoulder to shoulder. Um, so Sandy is gonna talk uh, you know, more about some of the work that we've done, but just you know, to highlight one, if I think about responsive classroom and the work we've done in responsive classroom in the elementary setting, we knew that we needed to offer more um, and responsive classroom 
was an approach that allowed us to really start working on the culture and the climate within our schools. And we offered this to our staff um, on a volunteer basis. And we went with them. And I think that is really an important thing to note, that principals, assistant principals, program heads, the director of fine arts, they all went to the same training with the teachers. They learned the same practices. And now we carry that over when we're meeting with our staff. So when we start a faculty meeting, I'll start it very much like a morning meeting because that's what Responsive Classroom does with their students within their classroom. Um, you know, our high school staff, as um, Shelley mentioned to you, they have been working on the H block um, and receiving a lot of professional development, but that has been in conjunction with the administrators in their building and their building administrators participate in H block. And I think that is really something that, you know, stands out. And our same thing with our middle school principals and our middle school staff, where they have been working to develop web where everybody belongs. And I know you're gonna hear a little bit more about this in some of the upcoming panels, but just to mention that in terms of professional development, it isn't just about the social emotional curriculum, the responsive classroom or the second step. As Shelley said, we are developing all of our curriculums with a SEL mindset or a culturally responsive mm -hmm. mindset. So our teachers and our administrators have been participating in the OCON, One Community, One Nation training together. We've been looking at books together that we've been adding to our school libraries. We've been doing those inventories together so that we um, are very much part of that practice with our teachers. Our second initiative was to contract with Panorama and administer surveys to our students and our faculty. We contracted with Panorama Education as an organization that specializes in helping schools gather data to improve school climate and culture, as well as to support students' social emotional learning. What we realized in Andover was that we were doing a fair amount of dipsticking in terms of where our kids were social emotionally, but they were with homegrown surveys or with some um, questions that our school councils may have created, and that we didn't really have a consistent body of data to quantify our students' social emotional experiences in schools. And it was one of the reasons that led us to Panorama. So individual schools administered um, our, our surveys to students in grades three through eight our first year. And we left out the high school because they were really working on that H block that um, Dr. Berman had talked about. But now we survey all of our students in grades three through 12 to gain insights into student life. As building leaders, we've used this data to help us inform our school practices. It's helped us to identify goals for our school improvement plans. It drives what we offer in professional development. Our teachers are using the data from the panorama surveys to write their professional growth goals and for, for themselves. Um, it has been uh, something that has um, led to professional learning um, communities within our schoolhouses as well as within the district. And we have even started to offer some staff development courses um, to our teachers based on the data that we have received from panorama. The third initiative that the SEL Sprint took on was um, partnering with William and James and um, uh, working with our district and our school committee to send cohorts to the William and James Graduate Certificate, School Climate and Social Emotional Learning. Um, so William and James is a college that's here in Massachusetts. And we have now been able to send four schools. It's a nine month long study um, each team consists of teachers and administrators. There may be mental health providers, school counselors on the committee. Um, and um, it has been, um, so William and James is an evidence-based program um, and they really help you to develop your school culture and your climate. Um, and we work on core concepts of social emotional learning, systems change and coaching. Each school has been able to develop an action plan that is in line with the district's strategic plan. And now that we have four schools that have been part of this program, those schools are working together to continue to develop um, the action plan and to share resources. And then our last or our fourth major initiative of the SEL committee has been to establish our district school-based cultural climate committee, or what we refer to in Andover as the C3. So uh, at first we had one C3 committee that was for our whole district, but now each of our individual schools have a C3 committee 
Um, it may not exactly be called that, but that's the work that they do. And then we send representatives to the district committee to talk about what's happening there and then bringing it back to the school. So the C3 committee has brought building principals, assistant principals, classroom teachers, social workers, curriculum coordinators all together to combat racism and to create identity safe schools. They've had three priorities um, that the C3 committee has set forth. Their first was in terms of terms and concept training. So what um, they asked are what are the terms that we need to understand about issues of diversity inclusion and membership in order to create safe and inclusive environments. Their second was responsive training. So how do we respond when difficult moments happen in the classroom and schools? And I can tell you that our district C3 committee has been um, so uh, helpful the past few days, um, helping us to respond. And then the third priority is the curricular training. So how do we ensure that our curriculum is inclusive to all voices, narratives, and cultures? Um, and we reevaluate these initiatives each year and um, provide some feedback back to our district leadership. But that's really sort of some of the work that we have been doing as district leaders to move this forward. Thank you, Pam. That is so very useful and it sets a good tone here. So we're going to ask Sandy to speak next. And Sandy, I was so impressed with the intentionality of the professional development uh, that, that was just discussed. And uh, so what are, what are the types and the characteristics of the professional development that you have been using to really further your SEL and your culturally responsive classrooms? Well, thank you, Janet. So I'm Sandy Trock, Assistant Superintendent for Teaching and Learning in Andover. And just as Pam said, thank you so much for inviting us today. Um, so our professional learning program, it just bears mentioning, is a really rich and robust, large program where we work on induction and peer taught courses and online courses. But just as Janet said, I'm going to highlight uh, four components that Pam has prefaced and just go a little more deeply with the logistics of how we made those courses come to life. But all of our courses and our offerings are focused on teacher leadership and capacity building in content, pedagogy, and social emotional learning, culturally responsive learning. So Pam talked about this just previously. We, the district has made a significant investment in responsive classroom, which I'm certain many of you know is about pro-social systems and routines, largely at the elementary level, although we've brought some of that into the middle level as well. And the purpose of doing this is it gives us a common social emotional approach and builds a sense of belonging community that Dr. Berman talked about. On the screen, I've listed um, how long we've been involved in responsive classroom, both level one and level two, the core and the advanced training. Um, you can see we've trained a number of our elementary teachers. We'll probably train a number, uh, another 60 this summer. Um, these are all volunteers, but they do receive PDPs. Uh, we pay for the course and they receive PDPs. It's a four day course. This summer, due to the pandemic, we will be running both of these courses online. And it should just bear mentioning that um, through some um, collective bargaining work and so on, um, we were able to extend the elementary day by 15 minutes. And so not only does every elementary classroom have a morning meeting, but they also have some kind of closing meeting or closing experience, closing circle, where they've been able to take these practices and integrate them into the closing of the day. Um, we've also used um, responsive classroom in our own administrative retreats as well as adults. We try to practice these experiences as adult learners, not just with our student learners. Pam mentioned uh, the William James College, which is in Newton, Massachusetts. And um, this is focused on uh, building capacity that supports school climate and social emotional learning practices, mainly through evidence-based practices. So it's a 15 graduate credit course, blended learning. The district pays for the course and it has three practicum courses with field experiences. It's really a very rigorous uh, commitment for those school-based teams that sign up and volunteer to participate. We've been part of this for three years. We now have had four teams trained. And you'll see on each slide, I've noted uh, the financial investment that we've made. 
this is about $54,000 that we've invested in this, which has really helped to then support those educators to bring um, those evidence-based practices into their school cultures. Dr. Berman mentioned, and so did Pam Lathrop about the One Community, One Nation. So I'll just echo briefly. Um, we are committed to teaching our students historically accurate information and teaching and learning. And so we nicknamed this OCON, the acronym what for One Community, One Nation, is rooted in uh, civic dispositions and teaching students race, identity, and membership, and what it means to be a citizen in a community that understands and lives by those principles. And so this is a social studies curriculum that's integrated with art and literacy, and we've run um, several institutes over two years. They're three-day consecutive institutes that are immersive in um, literacy, theater arts, um, uh, social studies, civic dispositions. We've trained um, 119 elementary teachers. Uh, much of our elementary teaching force is, is trained in this. And um, we are now in working through the curriculum design for that. And we have pilot teachers um, who are moving that curriculum into action. And then my final piece that I'll just contribute today is about the facing history in ourselves. Um, this facing history, as many of you might know, comes from Brookline, Massachusetts. It's an organization that's dedicated um, to teaching and learning about hatred and bigotry with the goal of stopping it from happening in the future. Um, and again, our goal for this was to help build, as Pam said, identity safe classrooms. Um, and inclusive classrooms by teaching ourselves and others about race, identity, and membership. So I think you can hear a theme about how many of these professional learning components dovetail with our learning and also our students' learning. We trained last year the entire grades six through eight, our middle schools, and the entire grades nine through 12. This was every educator, including instructional assistant. So it was a really massive initiative. We engaged in many, many exercises of learning, introspection, um, film studies, article reading, journaling. Uh, it was a very intense, ex immersive experience. Um, and we are very grateful for that investment and that support because we've been able to take that training into um, our school cultures and climates. And um, that has spawned uh, and supported our cultural proficiency teams that Pam mentioned. We call this the cultural climate committees or the C3s, and uh, those connect to our district team. Again, what Pam mentioned. So it's about the professional learning that supports these systems and structures in the district. Um, those C3 teams support each the district and the schools, both preventative, preventatively and proactively um, with education and professional learning, but also responsively as matters may arise. Um, we received a $100,000 grant from the Cummings Foundation to essentially replicate some of those same principles at the elementary level. So we're in process now over a three-year phase to try and um, extend those same teaching and learning principles into the elementary level. And in closing, I would just say that we had a um, really massive initiative last year to revamp all of our children's libraries, um, K through five, um, to have our, our bookshelves really reflect what we call windows and mirrors. I see myself in those texts as a student, no matter what my race, gender, background, or ethnicity might be, and I also see windows on the world of um, communities and individuals that may be different from myself and my own experiences. And I'm very pleased to say teachers and administrators had a very strong hand in selecting uh, literature, um, that's high quality and diverse that now sits on the shelves um, robustly in every K-5 classroom. And it's something that brings me a lot of joy and pride. So in a quick nutshell, that's, uh, those are some of the professional learning structures that we have in place that Dr. Berman and Pam Lathrop mentioned. So um, this next question, Sarah, I think is on. Good afternoon. Question, Sarah, uh, the question that uh, you're going to deal with deal, deals with the, the mental and behavioral health of the students and the adult learners. And boy, is that an important topic that has emerged for all of us. So thank you. for taking Indeed it has. Off. Take it away, Sarah. Thank you. It's um, nice to be with all of you. So our, our overarching um, goal as, as we bring up the slides is to um, really focus on building a system of care. We have a definition from 
um, the, the Human Services Collaborative. And I've just highlighted some of the key terms that I see as drivers of building a system of care around mental health. It's flexibility in a coordinated network, multiple levels, culturally and linguistic, linguistically competent, uh, partnerships and a policy infrastructure. And the direction that we're moving in is, is from the left to the right. And a few years ago when we started the work, I think we were very siloed in terms of our practice. It was very um, much more reactive uh, in terms of um, crisis intervention rather than crisis prevention. Um, and moving toward kind of an exclusionary model where um, something would happen and we would respond and then the, the response would be one of more exclusion. And so the, the first thing that we looked at was um, building capacity and building the infrastructure that we needed um, in order to move forward. And, and we found that um, many of our, our team members were working in silos. They were the behavior analysts were, were a separate group, the social workers um, were a separate group under a social work coordinator. School psychologists um, also had a very narrow role definition of assessment only and contracted providers as well. And the, the sort of reactive approach looked a little bit like this. We, we had a child study team, something would occur with a student that, that would raise a concern. Um, and the result was um, maybe more adding more staff or therapeutic support outside the classroom. And then a cyclical crisis management might escalate and then ultimately end up in an exclusionary or an out of district placement. And so um, where did, where did, this is where we started, okay? And so we, we really decided that we needed to coordinate um, systems, people, uh, materials, programming, um, and, and everything from the ground up. So um, in looking at the policy level, leadership, management, um, what does the frontline practice look like? what kind of professional development is needed, and then also extending the work beyond the schoolhouse um, out into the community. And that doesn't just mean families, it means uh, interagency collaboration. So what are we coordinating? Um, acuity, we started looking at um, doing acuity maps at different schools to see uh, the level of need and the severity of need among our students. Um, as, as Pam so, um, eloquently described to you, we um, instituted a tier one model. Um, and then we, we've started to build out um, from there. And to start that work, we, we really needed to start looking at data. Pam referred to the, um, the panorama survey, uh, but we've also begun looking at um, a lot of other kinds of data, both qualitative and quantitative. So for example, um, the SOS um, assessment, and as well as the SBIRT, which is um, referral to brief intervention. Uh, Andover was a real leader in, in um, implementing that, that assessment. Um, now we're looking at pre and post assessment, the SSIS SEL, um, to look at individual students and their progress. And now we're moving out toward what would a universal screening look like. So we have a universal screening of climate and now we're looking at universal screening for students. And so um, the, the um, ways in which we're building um, teams around students include this cross agency service coordination. So for example, we've got the school um, and now we're building wraparound teams using um, a software called eCare Vault. And that's a, a central place where we can keep all of the data on the students and we can keep um, we can build service coordination teams. And so this is just a, a screenshot of the interface. Um, we can build teams within the school and also across agencies on students in a HIPAA compliant platform. And we can keep track of their data and we can communicate with both the student, the parents, and the agencies and the school. And so we're also coordinating people. Um, and, and I mentioned the silos in which people were working earlier. So we decided to combine our mental and behavioral health department underneath one uh, clinical director. And so now we have a clinical director that manages school psychologists, um, our transitions program psychologist, 
which is a program at our high school. Our board certified behavior analysts, um, our, schools, our um, school social work team, um, and then we also began to build out layers to that uh, personnel infrastructure, which includes now registered behavior technicians. So we, we developed a training model, we used um, a reallocation grant, and now we have um, a team of registered behavior technicians at the elementary level supporting those BCBAs. Um, all of that in infrastructure was built using restructuring and um, a reallocation grant that we're very proud of, and also a Department of Public Health grant. This is a million dollar grant over a 10 year period, um, and it's allowing us to um, add referral services and also to build out uh, one of our dreams um, in terms of interagency collaboration, which is a clinic in the schools program. So we're building our own in-house clinic um, with a partnership with a local mental health facility. And then the last thing that we're coordinating, of course, is programs. A few years ago when we started the work, we, we had no real intervention programs for our students. We have a wonderful, talented team of social workers. We're very fortunate. We've got 20 social workers um, deployed at our schools, but we have no real program models wrapping around the students. And so the first thing that we did was we built a wraparound program based on person-centered planning. That's the Renew program. And if you're interested in that, um, it's, it's one of the only research-based um, uh, programs in the country uh, for wraparound. And it comes out of the Institute on Disabilities at the University of New Hampshire. And if you Google the um, documentary film, Who Cares About Kelsey, you can learn a little bit more about that wraparound model. We also continue to build out our transitions program, which is a program for kids that are returning to school from um, some sort of a, maybe a mental health uh, hospitalization or other crisis, and it manages their transition back into the school community. And then in the center, we've been, and you see it's got a T there, I thought that was pretty clever, but <laughs> we've been gradually building up what we call our T3 program, which is a three-tiered um, mental health intervention program for students. Uh, first and foremost, it is inclusionary. There is no sub -separate, substantially separate model going on. Um, the foundation is either regular education or special education students who need regular support from the social work team. And then the middle is regularly scheduled blocks in with the, C the T3 staff. Um, and they're using the second step curriculum. And then the highest level is direct instruction that is co-taught from a teaching team, a social worker, a psychologist, um, using directed intensive mental health modules that targets um, children's uh, specific needs um, who are in the program. And since, since we've started this program, we have uh, dramatically reduced the number of um, students who have been placed out of district in the pilot school. And we have been fortunate to add another pilot down at uh, Principal Lathrop's building and we are building it up through the high school um, in the coming year. So that is where we started and where we are now. And we are, as Dr. Berman pointed out, a work in progress. Thank you, that was wonderful. We appreciate uh, all that information. Um, we know that we need a, a support system that goes pervasive throughout the district. So I'm looking to Susan to talk a little bit about the Andover Public Schools Board of Ed or school committee and what their policies and practices um, are doing to support the work. Nice to be with you. And I, I wanna start by just saying, um, the primary responsibility of a school committee or, or a board of ed is always keeping what's best for our children at the forefront. I think um, after listening to, to um, Shelly and his team, um, I think they have the much heavier lift of, of implementing uh, the policies that are developed by the committee. Um, and I think it's important that we have partnership back and forth between the operations of the district of the district and 
in learning from our educators, I, I believe that I, I know that I and members of my committee um, embraced that strong learning really happens when children feel welcomed, when they feel safe, when they feel included in the environment, included in their learning, um, comfortable making mistakes, comfortable challenging themselves. And I, I have personally seen that as a parent of a student who has been um, in these classrooms where social and emotional learning is emphasized and you, you see a dramatic difference in how they're able to engage in the learning of, of topics or subjects that um, previously had been challenging, very challenging for them. So I believe that the openness, the communication, partnering with our educators, um, creating policy not in a vacuum, but with with them and providing budget support helps um, in making sure that that we that we're providing them the necessary tools for them to move us forward. In doing that, and being a, a, a committee that that supports our educators, um, I think of the theory of action that Dr. Berman has created with his team. And I actually think of um, the first piece of the theory of action where we create caring and culturally responsive classrooms and schools and partner with families and community as the foundation of that learning. And then the curriculum and inclusive instruction and iterating through student progress and um, as being the blocks that build on top of that. And that enables our students to not only develop academic skills, but I guess what I think of as, as holistic skills um, in order to go out and be really productive, um, effective, caring, responsible members of our communities. That then takes us to the mission of Andover. Next, And this is Andover's mission, again, developed by Dr. Berman and his team. Um, but I just want to emphasize that we want our students to be aware of and respectful of differences, curious about differences, engaged by differences. And I think when we all take on that responsibility and when we all have a commitment to that, it creates um, opportunities for our children to learn from us and from our actions and works towards the collective good. And, and, and that is the basis again, I believe of, of, of the education um, and knowing that we all have something to offer towards the collective, to the collective good and to the building of very strong communities, both locally and globally. So we talk a lot about what we are doing for our children. And I know that Pam and Sandy and Sarah have all talked about the professional development that we do for our administrators and teachers and staff in the district. Um, but equally, not only in providing professional development, but we've also started in the recruitment effort as we bring more people into the Andover Public Schools. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see um, part of an ad for uh, an elementary principal for which we're undergoing a search right now. And we have actually included that we want people, um, our our consideration for bringing people into the districts will be um, a number for a number of reasons, but that demonstrating success in social emotional learning and cultural proficiency are extremely important to us. So not only training those that we have in our district, but bringing people in who have those experiences as well. And then if you go to the last slide, please, um, you will see a poster and for anybody who can see Dr. Berman, on your camera that is i believe over his right shoulder this poster is present prevalent throughout our district um, in all of our schools and many of our classrooms and i think this for me really encapsulates um, bringing all of the pieces together and as adults um, we have made a commitment to help our students feel safe and connected and confident and valued and helping them to, to learn how to think globally and deeply and critically and creatively, to believe in themselves and know all along that we have a team, a committed team of educators, a committed team of policymakers um, that are there to support them in their learning. And uh, when you put all those pieces together, 
um, it creates an environment that supports this practice. That was wonderful. Thanks so much. Sure. Anna, um, one of the things that we are always concerned about is how are we measuring the effectiveness and how are we measuring success? So um, what, what do you use to assess progress in the areas of social emotional learning and um, CRP? Sure. Um, so as Lois brings up the slides, uh, one of my first slides has a um, quote. I was lucky enough to participate in a webinar last week where Tracy Benson, the author of Unconscious Bias in Schools, was one of the panelists, and he shared this um, definition of educational equity that comes from the College Board. So I kind of unpack this into guiding or essential questions. So I'm always looking for how do we know that all students are learning with both in both their academics and social emotional learning at high levels? How do we know that all students are provided with appropriate supports? And how do we know that all students are in an environment with high expectations? And layered on to all of those questions, not only are we doing all of these things, but are we doing it in a culturally responsive way? Um, so we have a student and staff survey where with, through Panorama, we're measuring um, school climate and um, student connectedness. So we have um, student competency surveys in the areas of social awareness, growth mindset, and grit. And we measure students' connectedness um, in school in the areas of belonging, safety, and engagement. Additionally, we survey our teachers in the areas of educating all students, school climate, professional learning about SEL, and their resources for student support. Um, so this is a quote from Peter Drucker, what gets measured gets managed, and on the flip side, how do we know what to manage if we're not measuring? So facts, not feelings, so having a data-driven culture. So this kind of came from attending a lot of meetings in um, a former district that I was in. We would hear a lot of um, vague things like a student is struggling, but there wouldn't be really specifics into how or what or, or why why that student was struggling. Um, in addition, I think it's always really important to focus on your individual context. So we know that in Andover, 95% of our teaching and administrative staff, plus or minus, is white, but only 68% of our students are. So we need to consider all of that data and our, our approaches um, within that context. So who's represented in data and decision making, who's not represented, who's leading the work, and making sure that we're disaggregating data and considering other data points that may not be typically measured. Sharing out results, so we're always making sure that we share out multiple data sources. So in addition to our panorama survey, Massachusetts administers a vocal um, voices of climate and learning survey to students after they take the MCAS. So we're kind of looking at um, similar, similar measures on both of those surveys to see if they align. We're looking at um, student achievement, student um, college matriculation rates, and persistent rates, and always being sure that we provide additional resources and support. So um, one that I've shared as I've gone to talk to the different high school departments is um, Lads and Billings Principles of Culturally Responsive Teaching. Anna, thank you very much. <clears throat> Shelly and, and your team, we greatly appreciate um, all the information you gave us. Um, so Shelly, before we get to some of the questions we had talked about, one of the questions that came up uh, during the chat room, I'm not sure if you or, or somebody else could answer, but it's a two-part question. One was asked, and the second is something we've talked about, which is that the question of the universal screener. Uh, do you use the universal screener, and if so, which one? And then after you answer that, I'll surprise you with the second question. <laughs> I think it's probably Sarah's going to jump in on that one. Yes, as you as you know, as you saw, we use the Panorama Survey, which is really um, uh, a measure of climate and and not directed to individual students. And so, what we've been doing is uh, we've been reviewing and and trying out some universal screeners that will um, directly measure our students. And one of the ones that we're that we're working with right now out of the um, tier three program is the SSIS SEL, which is, and, and we're doing pre and post testing with that. Um, but in a more global sense, the, the other ones that we've looked at, we've looked at the Devereaux um, and right. we're looking at the, the BMAS behavior intervention measurement. Um, I'm trying to remember the whole acronym and acronym. Um, but it's very important to make the distinction between 
uh, universal screener for SEL and a universal screener for mental health. And that's the reason that we rejected the Devereaux. It was actually too castle aligned because we think that through the work that we've done with responsive classroom and um, the depth of knowledge of our staff and our administrators, we're, we're not necessarily needing to pick up on that piece. What we really need to do is find the, the hidden children that have mental health challenges that have not been identified yet. And so that's the direction our sprint is leaning toward right now. And so a more mental health oriented screener is is what we feel will be more effective. Shelley, um, thank you, Sarah, for that. Um, and when you talk, Sarah, about mental health issues and other sorts of things, how do you possibly manage that? Uh, Shelley, it, it, like within the context, I think you have some more slides to take us home today, but the issue of equity and excellence uh, to your commitment yet. So you've done the screener, you had to identify the kids. What do you do about it? And, and what are your leadership principles that guide this work? That's a, that's an excellent question. And I'm actually going to ask other people to jump in because I think this is a broad question that we're all addressing right now. Um, you know, we have established equity as a, as a major priority. And on one level, we're seeing that as the, the kind of uh, support for our teachers in, in terms of creating a positive environment for our students. Uh, that's where responsive classroom comes in. It's uh, creating an inclusive environment. Uh, we are also looking at that in terms of the literature that you heard about, seeing that we, and the literature is just one example. Are we, is our curriculum representative, representative of the diversity of our, our society? And how do we, uh, as, as I think Sandy said, how do we you know, make sure that there are windows and mirrors so that you know, students see themselves and they, uh, within the, and they see uh, the, themselves reflected in the literature that they're reading and the work that they're reading. So when we're teaching history, it isn't just about you know, old white men. It's you know, like us more. <laughs> Um, but the, uh, but you know that it's much more diverse. And then the other area, which is an area that I think we've all been working on, is universal design for learning. How do we change this so we make our curriculum accessible to all? Uh, and you know, I know all of us have been working on that. But Sarah has been leading that work. I'm actually going to ask. You know, I think Sandy has been really working in the last couple of days just to deal with the crisis around us and respond to the equity issues. And uh, Sarah, do you, uh, Sandy, do you want to ju just address that for a minute, that same question? Well, it's a, it's a really big question. And the first thing I thought more when you said it was broad-based capacity. Um, you know, I think here among the different, my colleagues, they have talked about um, what we sometimes have called tier one supports and tier two or even more specialized supports. So the first thing I think about is just building teacher leadership and capacity in every educator and every IA, every, every educator. And that's something Dr. Stetson and I work on a lot through professional learning so that um, every child has that sense of belonging and community in the classroom. And to Dr. Berman's point, I think with the events that are now happening um, in our nation and in our local communities, um, you know, none of us exactly have the right answer, but I think we feel like we have an instinct about how we want to respond to our students. And I think the systems, the structures, the professional learning, the training, everything that we've been talking about in, in Andover Public Schools are the resources we've been pulling off of so first of all, our best supports have been our staff. Our C3 community came together almost instantly and said, let us put together educational resources, children's literature, articles for parents, you know, podcasts, everything we could, we felt was important in understanding race and racism. And let's renew our commitment to this um, beyond what we've already done. And even over the weekend, people were working 24 seven to put out um, statements of unity, communications, curriculum materials. I don't think we would have been able to do that had we not had not all these supports that we've been discussing been part of our commit our collective commitment over time. So um, that's just a small fraction of what's been happening. I, again, I'm not sure we have all the right answers, but 
Um, I do think we feel like we're in a really committed, strong community for our students. And right now, specifically for our black and brown students, um, that we stand with them and our families, so. You know, that uh, terrific answer. Um, there's a question coming in. I want to, it kind of flows from what you were just sharing with the Sanders. So there's a question from Barbara Bottoms as a principal in Prince George's County, Maryland, and a co-chair of our early learning cohort. And, and she's asking a two-part question, wondering one about parent voice. Um, oh, look at Sandra smiling when I asked that question. Um, and, and other than the wraparound services, and then uh, wanted to know what mandatory uh, SEL professional learning uh, is there for staff. So the question about parents and connection also then mandatory, if any, for all staff. Well, I think I'd like to have Susan address the parent question because I think she's uh, just a, a parent activist in a sense, <laughs> and then ask Pam to address the mandatory versus, you know, cons and consistency. So Susan? First of all, um, the committee is always very open to being, um, having dialogue with our, our community. Um, we do that not only in the, the meetings, the structured meetings that we hold, but we, before the, before we all became quarantined, we offered opportunities to meet with people in small groups, um, non-quorum groups to be in compliance with open meeting law in order to have dialogue with parents about their concerns. Um, I actually am the liaison that attends a monthly meeting that Dr. Berman has with all of the PTO and PAC leaders in our district. And that's a tremendous opportunity for um, the leaders at each of the school buildings to have dialogue with the superintendent and with the school committee and others on his team um, about issues of concern to them and also for, for us to get input. Um, I know we've had a... I, I know Dr. Berman's had a lot of really good feedback from parents on, on the distance learning and things. Um, and I imagine that, that I think we have a meeting coming up this week that there will be a lot of discussion about um, what's, been, what's been going on recently. So I think we're, we're a community that's very open to, mm -hmm. um, we have very engaged parents and we're, we're very open to having, having that engagement and having good good dialogue and trying to incorporate and, and we we talk about partnership with our parents and I think we work hard at at truly partnering with them so that answers you. your question yeah it does and Susan thank you so much for joining us today as a school board school sure. committee member Shelly thank you and the folks from Andover I really want to thank the panel. They, they, the preparation that went into this was pretty extensive. We covered a lot of material, but thank you all for, for participating in this. And I, I hope that uh, it's been useful to the people who are, have been uh, present. Yeah, I just want to say this has been a wonderful introduction to the work you've done. And this was wonderful information that was shared. It, it is nice to hear the ins and outs and what you've done. I'm excited to see how we get to the implementation and the, the next session. So Shelley, thank you so much. And thank you to your staff and for inviting us in and allowing us to take a look at what's going on in Andover. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week.